super pumped up for this. Um, this has been a dream in the making for about a year and a half, and I've got an amazing guest with me tonight, um, Brian Dombrowski from Wisconsin. Man, thank you so much for joining me, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, I really appreciate you asking me to do this. So, Look, I've, I've been following you, and we've been talking on Instagram now for like probably about a year or so, like a little bit here and there. And Yep. And I love the content that you put out there. The other day you were breaking down, which we'll get into a little bit later, but you were breaking down some postseason scouting and some rubs. And and I reached out to you and I thought, man, this guy, is, this is gold, you know, and other people need to hear this and understand this. It's it's a as I think that's an aspect that's overlooked right now is a rub. Mm. I mean, people see them, but I don't think they break them down properly or look at them, you know, as yeah. – what I've done, you know, I, I I just think there's more to that rub than just that's a nice buck. So. That that's exactly why I want to do this podcast is because I think there's a lot, there's so much information out there. I think a lot of times we generalize information and we miss out on that. I know I do, you know. And when I saw you breaking down that rub, I thought to myself, man, I've never thought that way. I, I've I've walked past, you know, I'll mark them on my Onyx, you know, and I'm looking for a general pattern, but I've actually said to myself, like, what am I using this information for? Like, you know, how's, how am I going to actually use this to hunt? And, um, and so the part of the pot, the, the dojo is to kind of get this information out there and break it down for people so they can use it in their own life. Um, but I want to back up a little bit, just trying to, you know, get your background a little bit. I mean, right now you can see all these amazing bucks behind you. I mean, that is a resume there. And I know I've seen your garage from from a video that you had posted, and and those bucks just keep going all those horns all the way around there. So why don't you tell us a little, little bit about yourself? Um, Brian Dombrowski, forty six, uh, Central Wisconsin. Um, I've been hunting since I was twelve, but I really didn't get into bull hunting until my early twenties, and I've kind of always done that by myself. I've never, um, I've just done it by trial and error, basically, you know, and reading books what we had back in the day, you know, um, but I, I fell in love with bull hunting and I've been doing that, chasing a lot of deer on public land, covering ground. Um, but I, I really love scouting. That's, that's really my, that's my forte. I, I love scouting more than anything else of that, you know, the hunting stuff. There's a video of you out there in the middle of summer with a head net on, and it looks like you're in a swamp somewhere and there's like, you know, like mosquitoes and bugs flying all around you. And that's like, I totally relate to that because I was in, doing the same thing with, with a, you know, mask on over top of me, but you, you, you're out there. Like, are you out there every weekend? Is that kind of yeah. what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah. I'm out there. Yeah. Every weekend, um, every chance I get, um, my wife and kid might go to bed at eight, nine at night and I might jump in the truck and go scout a property at night um, with the headlamp um that's yeah it's it's kind of it's kind of absurd if you think about it but it's i you know i i yeah i'm out there every chance i get after work for an hour any 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 time i can get out there i'm trying to get scout new properties yeah so how many miles do you think you put in last year did you do you track or i don't i mean i never added it up but i'm thinking somewhere in the range of acreage maybe fifteen thousand acres i'm thinking um and, but the property sizes aren't like huge. Uh, my biggest property I hunt is probably about 5,000 5, acres. Um, the rest, the majority of them are under 200. So that's a lot of 200 acre parcels. I'm, you know, about four or five different counties in this area. Um, but yeah, I've never added up the mileage. But I was, I, I, I know I, I watched you or whatever and you were uh, keeping track of your miles, but I've never added up the mileage yet. So. Yeah, I've only done that for the last two years, but I guarantee you, you're, you're out, you're out scouting me by a lot. Because um, I mean, fifteen thousand acres, I scouted, you know, I think it was like six thousand acres last year, and I was at two hundred miles, and I went out every weekend. Yeah. Um, and every time I posted something, you were posting something, so <laughs> I know you're out there quite a bit. Yeah. But yeah, it, I'm not covering every square inch of that, you know, that parcel either. I'm just hitting specific, you know, I got different things I'm doing on those properties based off of uh, history or where it is in my list of things I want to get done. That's what I was going to ask. Like, so are you, 
I would imagine you're, you're re-scouting, you know, property that you're familiar with. Are you grabbing new property every year or? Correct. Yep. Um, the three things I look, um, the reasons I scout are, uh, the first reason is going to be to, uh, you know, reevaluate properties I am hunting and a buck I'm going after. I want to, what did I miss? I got to reevaluate that property. Um, the second reason I'm scouting properties is I'm doing spot checks on properties. Maybe I haven't checked, you know, you, you check them one year, they don't look good. So then you go back into that, just a few different spots just to see if anything popped up in there. Um, I'll do that on properties. And then on the third is new properties that I've marked throughout the year that kind of just pique your interest that you just want to, but I, I do have a plan when I do this and I've been doing this, doing this plan for like, you know, over a couple decades now, probably since the mid nineties. And uh, I prioritize what I need to get done on each one of those properties. Um, you know, exactly what I want to do, what I want to look at, do my initial scouts and then uh, make a game plan for that final scout in the spring to get everything prepped for the hunt. So I want to, yeah, those that are the, yeah. yeah, I want to break that down a little bit in two ways. One, I want to hear how Brian does it for you. Yep. I mean, and, and you, you're at a level that, you know, I think a lot of guys strive to get to and, um, and then I want to figure out a way to break that down for, so if we're using the dojo concept, right? Like I think, scouting is like a black belt level for you like you definitely know what you're doing on a high level and and i want to i want to hear about it but i also want to break it down for the guys who are more of like a white belt yellow belt you know guys who are just getting into it or who are looking to step up their game maybe they've done it you know the same way for a long time but so the first i'd like to start with you you said you have a you kind of have a a plan can you kind of break Correct. that plan down a little bit so my pl the first thing you do before you even step foot in the woods is you have a goal. What, what do you want to do that year? Do you want to shoot a goal? Do you want to, you know, you're, you're, you're having a, you have, you have to have a goal. And my goal is uh, on the properties I hunt is to take the biggest body, you know, most mature buck, I guess, on that property. And based off of that, I will prioritize my uh, spots and, you know, as time permits, I'll prioritize those spots, go in there, check those out. Um, the, the first thing before I even head out there would be to have a goal. Mm -hmm. The second thing I like to do once I get on that property, um, I'll quickly look over some of those aerial photographs like everyone's doing. And I'll briefly, I don't put a lot of time into aerial photographs like a lot of guys do, um, but I'll quickly mark some points of interest. And I, I just like going on these lazy walks through these properties, checking out these points of interest marking everything you find and then bring it back to your house and kind of lay it out. But what kind of, I guess what kind, for, what kind of ground are you, are you hunting? Like, what, like, is it the same or are you, are you doing different type of ground? We got, I got, uh, I hunt North Dakota and I hunt Wisconsin. Um, I want to either get out to Nebraska and Indiana this year, but Wisconsin's pretty flat where I'm hunting. I, it's probably similar to maybe where you're hunting in Michigan. Um, it's pretty flat. Uh, farmland, central part of the state. There's some farmland, some big woods, a lot, you know, there's marshland. Um, hunting about four or five different counties around here. Um, but it's, it's, North Dakota is different, of course. You know, they got, there's a little hillier areas over there I hunt. Um, but there is some of the same flat area I hunt over there too. So but it's, it's flatter. So. What, 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 piques your interest in those areas. So you said, you know, you're kind of looking over and you, and you don't spend a lot of time on it, but something will pique your interest and that's where you're, you're kind of going. I need to, so if I step foot on a property, um, there's a couple different things that peak. I'm looking for primarily a uh, big buck sign on these properties I'm hunting. Um, I'm looking for a specific type of rub, um, specific bedding areas, um, just, just how I approach it, I kind of, uh, that's that's what really piques my interest on those, I guess. Uh, I don't know how, you know, as far as getting too deep. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, go as deep as you want to go, it's okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess when we're talking about big bucks, like what's the age class that you're going for? 
I'm trying to go for, there's not a specific age class. I want to, I want to try getting some over three and a half around here, three and a half, four and a half years old in this area. Um, we do not, have, we don't have a lot of big deer in this area. Um, but I enjoy going out there and, you know, putting, uh, putting a, you know, resume together on these, you know, the deer that we have around here. It's a challenge. Um, I do enjoy, you know, I do enjoy that challenge around this area because it is harder to go after them. Well, um, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear you say the age group because I think a lot of guys, you know, a three and a half year old deer is a, a real target for them. I, I think a lot of them, I mean, myself included, yeah. um, you know, and I think sometimes we hear conversation about a five, six, seven year old deer and, and that's a, a completely different animal. And I, I do think pressure makes makes even a three year old a different animal when there's certain types of pressure. But yeah. but since we're probably talking about the same age class, so most guys are trying to go after. What are some of those those specific, you know, like bedding areas you're talking about or specific sign that you're looking for? Because I think that'll help them a lot. So the sign I'm looking for, um, of course, you're looking, you, you can't beat a, a, you know, nice size track. I like a nice, I'm looking for, I don't see a lot of tracks in the areas I hunt because of the ground. It's a lot, it's pretty sandy over here. Um, I'm look, I'm a big rub guy and or I'm a really big rub guy. And I, I think a lot of people overlook rubs. Um, I believe that's that buck's signature. And based off that rub, you can see different characteristics in that rub and I will take that rub and follow it all the way back through the woods, back to where that buck is usually bedded. And I will put sits together based off of that. Um, what I, what I like about these looking at the rubs and so I shot a buck a couple of years back and I did some postseason scouting on that buck. And what I noticed he had a split, he had a split brow tine. And I could track that buck through the woods based off that split brow tine marking in that rub. You had two parallel rub, you know. And then once you find that, you see what size diameter tree he likes. You see the type of tree he likes. And you can you can follow that buck right through the woods, basically, based off that rub. And then fill in the blanks, you know, based off feeding, bedding, that kind of, you know. It'll take you right back to it. Like, let's say a buck has a, oh, I was going to say, let's say a, a buck has like a, a bladed brow tine you're probably going to notice in that rub it's going to have maybe quarter inch or half inch swaths you know it's not going to have like the, the points you know like in the tree but it's going to have the you know more of a half inch or quarter you know you're going to see more of a peeling effect i guess or let's say you have uh, a lot of purling down at the bases that might be a rougher rub so if if, if you're doing your uh scouting and you know you're, you're taking inventory on those deer based off your uh, trail cameras. You you can see the deer, you know you can match the buck up basically with that rub. Then you can target it based off of that. Um, like the one you got this year with the turkey feet, he probably had some pretty unique rubs, and you you probably could match up some of those characteristics in those rubs if you went back there. Um, what you just said there, if you went back there, that you, you just said you went back after you killed a buck and, and, and kind of broke down his habits and, and looked at yeah. his rubs that, that is like, that that's just opened up my, my mind. Like I, I'm not right now. I want to go back and go look for some of that sign. Yeah. Um, cause that is amazing. Cause it would tell you so much and really kind of educate you on how at least that deer, but I would imagine it educate you on how the deer might use, it you know, might use their, their sign to be able to find them in the future, the ones that are still alive. I thought that that's amazing. That's a really good idea. Yeah. The, the one I, the one with the split uh, brow tines, um, I shot him about a mile and a half from where I had a picture of him. So I, I knew how he was, that, that tells me how he's moving through that marsh. So I can, you know, I can backtrack him to where I had a picture of him. And then I can see where he was bedded based off my uh, trail cam picks, you know, right after I knew where he was bedded. And then, um, but yeah, I, I was able to go back and kind of recreate how he was moving through the landscape. And the, the bucks to this day are still doing that, you know, they're still moving through the landscape that way. So once you, once you get a spot like that and build up that historical data, 
as far as, as long as nothing changes, you know, geographically with the trees getting cut and that kind of stuff, you know, um, they'll kind of recreate that every year. They'll kind of move around the landscape the same. So if you would go, but yeah, if you went back to your, you know, your buck this year and you'll be able to match up his, you know, you'll be able to maybe take an impression of his, you know, brow tines and match it up on a tree is based off of that. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting because they'll, they'll rub the same height, um, the same, you know, similar diameter trees, similar types of trees. And you can, you can pick apart, you know, that, that buck and just take them right back to where you, you know, where they preferred bedding complexes. So how do you think um, bucks are using rubs? I mean, is, is there different types of rubs? Is there travel corridor rubs? Is there, you know, rut rubs where they're getting aggressive? Like how, how can you break down and know which is which? Um, a lot of times I break them down based off of age. Um, you do got to travel corridor. So let's say you're in, we'll go we'll work on the age thing first um, because that, you know, what time of year is that rub being made? Um, I like, you can tell the early season rubs based off the, let's say you see them back in the bedding. You can look at the foliage on the trees, you know, is, does this type of tree have foliage later on in the year or not? And that, that'll determine if, you know, that can determine if that's an early season rub. Um, a lot of the early season rubs are made on clusters, you know, as they're trying to shed their velvet and they're right around the, you know, their staging areas or bedding areas, you know, you can see the, the black and the green of the wood. Um, I don't know if you ever noticed that, um, you know, the coloration. Yeah. So I'll, I'll and you, you can see the little black in the green and I don't know if that's mold or whatever that is, you know, but there's a little black in the green and you can tell that's an early season rub versus a later season rub. Um, but you'll find them. So if you, if you go, let's say you have a wood lot and or a marsh and you got an oak flat and you find a rub in that oak flat you know that's made at you know when the deer are coming in there to feed probably at night so i'm not going to pay the only thing i'm going to you know that's going to tell me is if a specific buck was there and then the direction of that rub you can take it and kind of connect the dots right back to his uh you know because it's going to be on a certain side of the tree yeah. coming into that wood lot you can kind of backtrack them both ways mm, that's so good so how do you use it in the postseason so you you know for next year like is this are you looking for bucks that you haven't killed yet and and assuming that they're going to bed in those areas you know and i guess also then you're primarily using that for like an early season attack is that what i'm thinking like if you find a, a buck rub back to its bed you're you're going to plan on getting him pretty early in the season then that's yeah that's what i'm planning on um i'm using so i put all the you know i, I kind of make a list of different bucks based off the rubs. I don't know if that, I don't know possibly, you know, if it's a new spot, I don't know what buck made it, but I'm going to follow that back to his bedding. And but it's usually a bedding complex. It's never a solo bed per se. You know, they, you know, they might bed over here or over there, but it's a, it kind of a bedding complex in a lot of these areas. And I'm going to find a staging area and I'm going to get a, I got to find out a piece of live. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go back there and put a mock scrape in that staging area to collect all the inventory and all the bucks using that bedding area just to see if he's still alive. And if he's alive, he's going to be on that uh, camera usually. Um, if he's not, if I got nothing on there, I'm not going to, you know, he might have got killed that year. But I do, I use it for an inventory process to, to figure out how they're using the land and uh put a game you know plan of attack on them but i do like it for early season definitely is there as the season goes on do you kind of move off rubs or or anything like that i mean i guess you're probably not on rubs correct you're, you're using that that information to set up your game plan for the early season yep. as does it does that data become less important as the season goes on no um this is where you is it knowing where all these rubs are and how they're moving through the landscape, you kind of have an idea of how they're going from bedding area to bedding area, possibly check on those. So you're going to find the travel corridors based off those rubs. Um, but I am using it for, let's, let's, you know, I, I'm able to, I'm able to tell um, if that buck is spending a higher percentage time in a certain area based off these rubs, rather than maybe visiting a door area and making a rub as and his way to and from there. Um, but I am using them, 
uh, you know, early season for, you know, to get on the betting where I think they're betted. And it's, it's a good tactic as far as just figuring out how they're using that land. Um, you know, I don't, so. How many, how many cameras do you run? I run this year. I had the most ever and that was 13. Okay. Not, I mean, <laughs> so a good number, but not a lot compared to what we hear these days. Right. Like, yeah. You yeah. know, guys run it. I mean, I run about 30, you know, um, and I got to be honest, like, I, I don't have as like you, it sounds like you have a pretty strong strategy. Like, are you basing all more, most of your cameras off of like that idea of, of identifying a rub, going back towards the bedding complex, setting up a mod scrape, taking inventory? Um, is there anything else you're using your cameras for? Um, I, I will put them on travel corridors once in a while. Um but most of them are going to be on for an inventory purpose outside of a bedding complex where I can, or, you know, or if let's, I, I will use them. I use mock scrapes a lot too. Um, I'm a big proponent of that. I've been using that. Um, and I like to use those. Let's say you have a bedding complex and you cannot get in between where that buck is bedded in a private property as he crosses and goes to the food. He's bedded pretty tight. So you can use that mock scrape to possibly shift their movement a little bit before they go to feed. You know, maybe he'll swing off to the left of that bedding complex a little bit and then head to the feed where you can hunt them. Um, you, you can use those for, you know, the shifting movement, I guess, a little bit. But um, primarily, yeah, primarily for inventory on scrapes I use cameras for. Wow. So when you talk about bedding complex, and I'm sorry if I'm taking this in a way that oh. you don't want to go right now, I just – it's it's a you're, you're saying a lot that I'm really interested in. So there's been this big focus on on beds, yeah, and, and finding a particular you know box specific bed. Um, I mean, is that am I hearing more like a bedding complex plan for you, or or are you also going in and looking for a specific bed? I'll look I'll look for a specific bed. Um, th these bigger marshes, it, it seems like they'll bed in different areas of that, you know, acre, you know. Um, Trying to think of a size that that bed, let's say you have a five thousand acre marsh, and that bedding complex might be you know fifteen acres or so, you know, and based off the wind, based off of direction of travel to the feed at that time of year, they're going to be heading different ways out of there. So you, you got to document all the spots you can find that buck's possibly bedded based off his rubs, because you can follow them to different beds, and then you can put a strategy together. Um, let's say you got the oaks falling on this oak flat and the wind's out of this a certain direction, you can probably safe to assume he might be coming out of that bedding complex right here and probably using that one bed that you had marked. So, or, you know, so you, let's say some guy has soybeans over here and it's drawing them over to here. And, you know, so you can, you can, that's, that's the way I kind of use it. Um, feed, you know, the different beds based off the, you know, food, and maybe it's a time of year type of thing too. You got to work in there based off the foliage. Mm -hmm. There's all these different, you know, wind. There's there's so many different variables that can happen there. Um, but I will try to mark that particular deer. I'll try to find each one of his beds in that marsh. You know, if if he's even bedded on that marsh. Because um, let's say I think MSU Deer Labs came out with uh, average home range of a whitetail buck is what 650 660 acres something like that mm -hmm. and uh so that's a key number i keep in my head all the time because a lot of my properties are a lot smaller than that so i gotta i have to determine how much of that buck's playbook i have to use you know for like a percentage type hunt you know is this a high percentage hunt if not you know i may prioritize that buck differently than another one um, I think Eberhardt does a lot of the, you know, uses the percentage principle, a lot of things, you know, all the states versus, um, but uh, I'll use that percentage on that. But if that buck isn't betting on that property, if I determine, you know, I'm following that buck's rub line and it, you know, shoots right off the property or something like that with no beds, then you got to determine when, when is he using it? What time of year? Why is he using, you know, and maybe if that's going to be more of a timing hunt then. You're going to take your shot at that buck based off, you know, when you think that buck made that rub and what, you know, why would he be coming back through there? So that, that'd be a timing incident. There. What is some of the, the data that you're collecting to try to make that decision of when that, 
that rub is being used or when he's using that, that travel corridor? Um, age. I'm trying to, uh, the age of the rub. Um, I like to, I might go in there during the year and check if these rub lines are open. Let's say it's a historic rub line. I might quick do a, you know, quick spot check on that to see if that rub line opened up. Um, you know, just walk in there, stick your nose in there and kind of pop back out. And that'll tell you if he's starting to use it. Um, I might even throw a camera up on that trail or something like that, just to monitor it for a week, just to see if he's in there. Um, but, it, you know, age of the rub, um, historic data. Let's say, you know, you've been chasing a buck for a few years and you kind of know where he's moving through that marsh. Um, I'll use that. But, yeah, that's. I, I I saw a a post you made about a, a buck that you were chasing for like four years. Yeah, still, still. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. I mean, that's a how how big? I mean, that is a huge whitetail. Yeah, he's a. That's the one I was after this year. Um. Okay. Yeah, just picked the scab off that injury. So. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, so I so I was at, I've been after that buck for a few years now. Um, I'm kind of. You know, I, I, his rub is ingrained in my head. So whenever I see it in that marsh, I, you know, I know who made that rub based. I'm like, he was here, he was here, he was here. And I had four encounters with that buck in the last three years. And I was last, uh, last year, not this year, but the prior year, um, I had him early season. He likes to go in this one spot early season. It's actually pretty close to everybody um i see people walking fast and i'm just kind of sitting up there because this buck really doesn't move much um, but i had a couple encounters with him like minutes after shooting hours like i'm getting down out of my stand just hanging from you know right before my platform and i look and i see him walking to that mock scrape i put up you know 45 yards away and i'm then i hear him hit his antlers and then i hear him walk away or i'll took a shot at him last year also like opening night and I happened to jump him opening night um out of the clump of brush he was in um because I got close you know mm -hmm. um yeah that's uh, that's a nice I think he I think this year he shipped a little bit if if I haven't heard of anyone getting him I think I had one encounter with him earlier in the year where uh he had it was I like to hunt mornings early season mornings. I don't know if a lot, you know, a lot of guys never used to do that. Yeah. Um, I love hunting early season mornings because that plays into getting on that bed before they're walking back in. But you just have to make sure that, you know, you there's, there's a distance for them to walk back into it so you can get in there before daylight or before they get in there. Um, but I had a encounter with them and I was hunting probably 40 yards off his bed that he was, had been using and the wind was you know as long as the wind was steady it was i was good as soon as that wind let up it would pull right back to where he was coming and yeah of course uh it pulled right back to where he was coming and right at daybreak i heard whoosh, you know so yeah and i think i saw him one other time this year and then with the bird hunters that were in there this year and all the pressure that was in there i think it I think I may have relocated them last weekend, mm. you know, about a mile and a half away in that marsh. So I, you know, it's a very similar rub. So I just got to get eyes on them. So. Yeah. Your season goes what to the 15th of January? Um, Seventh or eighth this year. Oh, okay. And then there's some other areas in the state that go to the end of the year, end of January, I think. Okay. Yeah. Medical units or something like that. So. so you got some time. You still have a few weeks to go after them. Yeah, I don't have any time this week. Um, but hopefully, maybe on the weekend. Yeah, there's a couple couple sits I probably could get away from. I gotta be nice, and maybe I can slip away. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, I, there's a lot of rubs in the woods. Yeah. What what catches your eye to want to go investigate and find out what buck made it? I wanted if if I see something abnormally tall on a tree that really piques my interest um doesn't have to you know so a 
If I see something chest high walking through the woods, which I do not see that very often, chances are it's made by a, you know, a pretty decent buck. And that's a type of rub I only come across maybe three times a year from a different deer. So I, I'm sure big bucks make smaller rubs, you know, but I don't have, you know, I, I don't, I don't know all these areas that possibly they are. So I'm, I'm looking for that specific sign that, um, you know, big, tall, big, you know, if, if it doesn't have a big rack, it might have a big body on it. You know, I'm not a huge, I don't need to, you know, shoot a huge buck based off a rack, but it has a big body on it. I love that. Um, but yeah, if it's, it's big, you know, big and tall and a big tree, I love that. So yep. I think everyone would see that and be like, wow, that's nice. You know, mm -hmm. so I want to follow that. So I'm, I'm going to bird dog it all the way back then, you know, just all the curiosity. Yeah. So I've, I've tried, I guess, you know, I said, I haven't paid much attention to it, but I've tried to follow a rub line before and I, I seem to lose it more, you know, yeah. quite a bit. I mean, what tips do you have for following a rub line? Like, is it, is there anything that, that helps you navigate that? I mean, do you ever come up dry where you're walking through and all of a sudden it's like, I can't find the next one? Um, I'm sure I have. Yeah, I'm sure that happens. I, for whatever reason, I seem to relocate it though somehow. Um, let's say you lose it in a certain spot. You just start like a, you know, maybe do like a bird dog pattern in there. Um, and usually you can pick it up again, but I mean, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure they go dry, you know? Um, but usually think, they're, usually they go dry. Maybe we're getting into some different type of cover, like a transition area. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you're getting a little closer to possible bedding. So you can kind of maneuver around there and relocate it in there. Um, but yeah, I'm sure they, you know, you, you'll find a, I mean, you might find a random rub somewhere and it, that's the only one you find, you know, maybe it's a, one of those cruising bucks, you know, just, you know, cruising on through. But, so, I mean, I think part of it probably for me is that I'm not identifying, you know, which, like which buck is, or rub is unique to a certain buck, right? right. So, I mean, I'm, I would imagine without doing that, you could kind of get lost because there's other rubs that kind of interweave in there and you can, yep. kind of, you can kind of lose your focus. So that's something that I would probably next time do is just really pay attention to look for a certain type of markings yeah that identify and just kind of keep trying to find that one how far how far have you followed these these rub lines before or I guess what's the average uh, we don't have a lot of big properties here mm -hmm. um, you know it's a, it's a lot of smaller acreage so I'm only seeing maybe a partial set of that deer's home range um but I have you know probably a mile mile and a half you can kind of track them through that marsh you know that you know a bigger area um, and that's pretty much their home, you know, you're cutting almost their whole home range that way. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, it's encompassing that area. So, I mean, if you find, you can kind of find its core area and then, um, or bedding complex it prefers and that's 650, 660 acre, you know, you kind of make a circle around that and you can eliminate some areas. Maybe he cruises, you know, you can kind of get a feel on how that buck's using the land and maybe where he's spending his time. Um, but just, yeah, so you're not, they're not going to be very long per se, you know, cause 650 acres isn't huge, but I always keep that in mind that that's, you know, the average tip of whitetail home range so, or for buck based off that. Um, so I, I kind of went hyper-focused on the rubs here and stuff like yeah. that, but so your post-season scouting, um, so you're going in, you're looking at these rubs, you're trying to identify, you know, bigger rubs, different characteristics. You talked about following it back and putting up mosh scrapes and putting up cameras. Are you doing anything else during the, the postseason? Are you looking at anything else? Um, yeah, I'm marking. So I'm going to be using, I'm going to be, when I'm walking in the woods, I got it, you know, either Spartan Forge or I'm using Onyx, one of the two. And I'm marking everything that I find as far as, um, I may not mark like the small, you know, the bucks that I don't think the rub is made. If I'm in a certain area, I'm looking for that certain rub. So I'm marking that on the map. Um, all the scrapes I'm marking, I'm really marking uh, primary scrape areas. That That's a big, you know, interest to me. Um, I'm marking all the beds that I find based, you know, for that one different buck. I'm kind of ignoring the other ones that I don't really want to chase after. I'm just going after where I think he's bedded. 
um, food sources. If I'm finding, you know, some different, you know, maybe a crab apple tree, like I found a crab apple tree a couple weeks ago, I hunted it. And that's a big, you know, old farmstead. I'm marking that. Um, I, I kind of mark everything when I'm going out there. And then I bring it back to regroup at the house to put a plan together to go back in spring to get stands prepped, um, mock scrape locations prepped for inventory, um, that kind of thing. But then, you know, you talk about a primary scrape area. Can you kind of break down what that is for for people who might not know? And yeah, yeah. So what I, what I feel a primary scrape area is is it's it's a it it, it could be an acre in size, could be less, but you're going to have a ton of scrapes. In a certain area, you're just you're gonna get there and be like, I gotta scrape here, I gotta scrape here. You're looking around, oh, there's one over there. There might be several scrapes in that little area. And what I think scrapes are, um, I feel they're just a social hub. They're a social um, hub for deer. I got, and I, I put out a lot of mock scrapes for inventory, and I will see does bedding in them. I'll see does pee in them. I got bucks bedding in them, bucks peeing in them. They're just a social hub for that, uh, you know, the deer. And I think a primary scrape area is an area that kind of in, where a bunch of different um, factors come in. Maybe there's different home ranges intersecting right there. So you get all these different deer coming to this area, kind of circling it, hitting it, and going back. So, but yeah, they are, it's a very, very good way to get inventory. Um, as far as a primary scrape area, if you find one of those, you want to really mark it and, you know, you're going to want to hunt that, you know, come, you know, come the rut, come, you know, you're going to, you're going to really go on a key in on that. Yeah. So versus the rain, you know, we can, I was going to tell a story later about like a random scrape, but if you find one scrape, eh, it might not be too interesting, but if you find a cluster, you, you know, I would definitely, if I was someone starting out, I'd really mark that and figure out how the deer are entering and exiting that scrape so you can get different stand sites based off the wind. So, but, and they're usually close to, a, a, you know, a bedding comp, you know, different bedding complexes maybe. So. So you had a story about a random scrape you wanted to talk about? Yeah. Um, you know how you're walking down a trail and you just, you're just walking down the woods, you're following this deer trail and there's a scrape there. Yeah. You know, yeah and you're like, huh, you know, you just look around and you just keep walking. You don't think anything of it. So you just, I was scouting a property, a um, couple hundred acres, probably you know, two, 300 acres. Not much sign for what I wanted to see. Where I saw that, where I found deer sign, there was a stand there and the guy was baiting. And uh, I, I went back. So there's this trail, there's a creek that cuts, intersects this property. There's a trail coming from the left and it curves at a 90 and heads right towards that creek. That's the only spot on that property I found a scrape and a rub. And I kept thinking about that and I kind of went for a walk and I came back to it and I looked at it again and I'm just standing there going, why is this here? I didn't know why, you know, it's just, I'm like, it's, it's not, it can't be random. So I'm looking and I'm looking and I happen to look up, I'm at the creek, the trail goes away from me and then cuts to the left along the ridge. And it's like, there's like a 15 foot elevation to my right. And I'm looking and I look right where that, what was that a 90, that trail? There's the, I heard you talk about this too. I see a faint trail going up the hill. And I see just that faint trail going right up that hill. And I'm like, okay, I'm like son of a gun. I go, that buck is monitoring this. He can smell it. He can see it. He's monitoring this scrape. This is his scrape. So I walked up that hill and it was probably 40, 50 yards, you know, and there's some pine trees. And there that buck was laying dead. Wow. <laughs> Laying dead? Laying dead. He got shot during gun hunting. He ran back there and he died. Just... Right yeah. Oh. Oh, great big 10 pointer. And uh um that that just that was a light bulb for me. Um just seeing that I'm finding these scrapes and random scrapes, people think, but a lot of times, even in hill country, it's probably, you know. That buck could be bedded off on this ridge and he comes down off that ridge and he just checks that scrape before he goes out. That's his scrape. You know, there might not be a lot of the bucks using it, but that, you know, when I'm walking those transitions and I see a scrape like that, you know, I'll be, I'm always looking. 
And uh, a lot of times I'll look into the thick stuff and there'll be a faint rub in the thick stuff. And then that, you know, why is that rub there? You know, mm -hmm. that's really, He's, that's where he's kind of snaking through, you know? So. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I ran into that a couple of years ago, actually on the whole, like uh, a bucks primary scrape where they're, they're, they're watching from their bed. Yeah. Um, and that was here in, in Michigan. And this is, I think the, the benefit of running a lot of cameras is that you can throw them up on random, random spots. Yeah. Yep. Correct. Yeah. And, and I've found a lot of good deer doing that, you know, and um, on this particular uh, scrape, I had a camera. And it was a kind of a crappy camera. I won't name it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I use a lot of them. Um, Actually, and, I, I think I got the same ones. They take great pics, though. Does it start with a T? No, no. Oh. <laughs> that would be an upgrade. I know which one you're talking oh, about. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, so I had what I thought was multiple bucks coming to this scrape. Yeah. And, um, and I just really couldn't tell what it was. I was getting ready to go to Illinois. So I came down and I grabbed the scrape out, or the, uh, the camera out of there and went home really quick and just kind of went through the card. Now, when you, when you look at the card, it's an HD, it looks amazing. Yeah. But the pics I was getting were all like distorted. It was yeah. one buck and it was, I mean, he was probably the size of this one here. Yeah. And, and, he was hitting it, which over here in Michigan, like that's, that's a good buck. And well, yeah, that's a good buck here. Yeah. That's a, yeah. And so he was hitting it and it was, it was his scrape. He was hitting it every, you know, like on a regular basis. And, um, a lot of times in the morning I, I, he would come in with the wind to his back Yeah, because he was circling up and going up on the ridge. Um, and then with the way that he circled up, he'd come back around and he'd be watching that with the wind yeah. coming over top of him. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was really amazing. Like, well, that opened up something in my mind. I'm like, okay, like, and I was hunting it all wrong. I had hunted a couple of times. I'm thinking every time I came in here, yeah. he was watching me walk in <laughs> on this thing. So yeah, yeah it, I, I never went back after that one. I don't know if he still exists. I have cameras around that area and I, I have never seen him again, but um, yeah, that was, that was something big for me too. And I, I, the random scrapes, I don't think I have the knowledge that you have like where you're kind of breaking it down and you've, you've got some understanding of it, but I'm throwing cameras up and on these random scrapes. And I've, I've found some really good deer to go after doing that. So wow. uh, as far as like a basic technique, even if you don't fully understand it all, if you can get some cameras and, and throw them up and it, that'll tell you a lot too, on which scrapes are more productive and which aren't. I mean, that's been a huge help for me. Yeah, correct. I mean, you, you might have some on the edge of fields, which get hit at night, you know, around here, you don't see, I don't see a lot of scrape activity in the open. Like the open woods, the open. Yeah, either do I. It's you know, um, and I you know you hear a lot of people talking about that. It's the placement of a scrape is key. Um, it has you know it's just that's especially when you're doing mock scrapes. Mm -hmm. You really want that. The placement is key. You want that just in that staging area, just outside the bedding. You know, that's to me that's key just the placement of it um they need what, to feel comfortable hitting that during daytime what's the staging area i mean just i mean i think a lot of times we talk about these things and, and we kind of understand it but for someone trying to get in a little bit deeper they kind of know bedding i think when we think of bedding at least i'll just give a simple version yep. of it just a really thick area where it's kind of hard for us to get through but deer can maneuver yep. or covered what's the staging area look like to me, a staging area is that transition zone right outside the bedding where they get up right at last light or they start to mill around and they get to the edge of the cover, just at that edge of the cover. And you're going to find a lot of, uh, it's somewhere where they're going to, you know, congregate right before they head out to the feed. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're sitting there, they can mill around, probably you're going to catch a lot of browsing action there, maybe a lot of, you know, as a deer gets up at night, he, you know, he poops. So you might have a lot of droppings in that area you might find a lot of cluster rubs right there where that you know if it's a you know if a lot of bucks are using their batcher group you're going to find a lot of clusters of rubs on brush and stuff in that area as they get up but it's it's just an area where um, they're basically just waiting for safety to get out into the you know because they can see better with the blue lights or the you know the blues and stuff so the um they're just waiting before they leave the you know the cover that had all need and that's 
that's the key, you know, as far as if you're going to hunt these beds and stuff, you, you got to push that envelope. You got to really push in there. And, you know, I, that just takes time, I guess, if, if you're, if you're a new hunter or whatever, to see how far you want to push in there. Um, I've pushed in there front, you know, you, you might bump a buck, but it might not be the buck you're after. It could be a satellite buck. So, you, you know, that's just, that's going to take time for people to get comfortable doing that because I've heard a lot of people, you know, they just, they want to hang too far back. You might be 150 yards back and that's, that's too far. Yeah. I mean, that was, um, for the longest time growing up, I mean, one of the biggest things back in the nineties and the videos was having a sanctuary area, you yeah. know, like, yeah. like, you know, or even you would read magazines about building a sanctuary area on your property. And it, the funny thing is I tried to apply that to, I've hunted public my whole life. There was a short stint where I hunted private, Yeah, but I thought even on, on, public you had to do that and I, I think that learning how to be aggressive is important um because you can totally mess your area up right, um, yeah. but you almost got to be willing to, in my opinion and feel free to disagree you almost got to be willing to mess that area up as you learn in order to yeah. learn it like I, I I couldn't learn it until I started really blowing up areas to know yeah. exactly how far to push and how not to push yeah. And once I blew out a couple good areas, um, I started to catch it. And then, you know, getting more aggressive alone, just yeah. that tactic alone has opened up deer to me that I, I never knew were possible. Yeah, correct. No, I agree with that. Uh, um, let's take out of state for, I don't run any cameras out of state. So my tactic is I just push into areas. And if I bump deer, I bump deer. Cause a lot of, a lot of the areas we're going, they're not very pressured you know as far as what i'm used to around here so those bucks maybe jump up or whatever you see them you know and you can but i'm a little more aggressive that way too where you you want to bump you can bump an area out if you don't even plan you might not even plan on hunting that spot so why why not walk through there you know see what's in there yeah uh, just get curious i guess and i i think what where you start to realize you know what you're doing is when you go in and you go too far and you immediately know you went too far <laughs> yeah yeah you know I, so yeah because yeah there was a there was a, there was a couple of years ago there was a uh a buck i shot it right behind here but um it was early season and i planned on going like mile and a half back in this property it was kind of just a pain in the buck to get back to but you know as, as i think dan always said you, you don't pass up sign you know you don't come back to that sign either you're yeah. gonna hunt sign you find fresh sign early season fresh rubs and stuff either hunt it or you, you know, write it off and keep going. I came to the spot, you know, it wasn't too far back in and there's all these rubs, fresh rubs. And I'm like, okay, there's a bachelor group, you know, a lot of times they're bachelor up. So I stopped immediately and I found a tree and I, I walked up to that tree, which was five yards away. I got my second stick on and there was a buck bedded 20 yards away in the grass, jumped up and ran. It was pretty windy. So I just said, well, you know, maybe he's a satellite buck. I proceeded to get up and uh, I sat there all night. And then all of a sudden I looked, you know, the sun's shifting. I looked 60 yards to my left later on in the evening. And all of a sudden I seen that rack move. He was still bedded there, you know. And what was crazy about that was it got, to, it was getting towards dark. That buck stood up and he didn't move. He just sits there. He just stands. He's scent checking. He kind of walks over here three, four yards, turns around, walks over. I mean, but he did not move until dark. And that, and then all of a sudden when the you know season ended, I heard him walk away. I mean, that's what we're dealing with in a lot of these situations. So I mean, that's why, you know, your entry and exit routes are so important that you don't burn that spot if that buck didn't get to you, you know, allow you another shot at him. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, it's that, that that just opened up something when I saw that. I'm like, you gotta be kidding. Yeah. And that's why postseason is so important too, because what I like, so I hunt a lot out of state. So yeah. yeah. Some in the last couple of years I go out and I'll if if I want to dedicate myself to one state and really pour myself into it and hunt it multiple times in the year, I'll go post or postseason scout, preseason scout, do all of that. And that helps you understand how things lay out. Because this year I went to this is a couple of weeks ago. I went to Indiana and um, I'm in a new piece in Indiana that I, I haven't hunted before. And I'm walking in 
and I'm I'm in it. Like I'm in the right spot. I'm I'm seeing the sign, and I'm tempted to set up right there. And I'm yeah. like, okay, like, and and I think just through experience, I realize mm, you need to go a little bit further. So I go in, and what I thought was thick bedding actually opened up within just a few you know yards. Okay, and the bedding was actually still another 150 yards back. Yeah. And so I, I moved, you know, all the way in and I got in the right spot and uh, I was in deer. I didn't, I didn't have a, a, a buck that I wanted to shoot. So that's an example where if I were there earlier, I would know and, and not be tempted to set up a little early and just kind of go in. Yeah. The opposite is true too, where um, also in that same trip, um, I go in on a different day and I get into the spot and I blow it. Cause I keep, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how this lays out. And I just kind of want to see, and I go a little bit too far. And you know, when you see that, that deer butt kind of walk away and it starts yeah. moving away yeah. and, I, and I realize, oh, I just, I just blew it. I just, I, just, I went too far. I, I got into his bed. If yeah. I would have postseason scouted that area, I would know mm -hmm. all of that already. And that's why postseason scouting is so important. Correct. Yeah. As, as far as the style of hunting I do, yeah. Or you do, mm -hmm. that's important to know where that buck is bedded. And that kind of takes the guesswork, you know, how close can I get? Because, you know, he's probably bedded here on this wind or this feed, if the feed is ha happening over here. So I can, you know, you might preset your trees or something like that and have all that figured out. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's that's where postseason scouting really comes into play. Um, I was going to, a, a random thought just came to mind, too, about how these bucks are bedding that I, a lot of times I find. And I, was, I think I had mentioned it about geographical um, areas. Uh, what I've been noticing is a lot of these more mature bucks are going to put a geographic, uh, just a uh, land feature in between them and the bedding. Um, let's say there's a creek. You got a stream cutting right through the middle of this property. He's, you know, and there's good feed to the west of the stream. Um, a lot of times, those little sneaky guys, I'll follow that rubble in right up to that creek. They'll cross that creek. They know they do a little jayhawk, but they're looking back at that creek as the wind's blowing mm -hmm. back. Or, you know, they'll they'll put that they'll put that creek as about you know just a, a fence, a gate, and they you know um, open. You know, I found other things where they'll put you know transition areas in the woods. You know, open fields or you know, grassy areas. They just, they, they put these features that make it hard for someone to come through, you know. Um, I, I've noticed a lot of that too. It's, you know, pretty purposeful. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That buck that I killed this year, he was setting up um, on a drainage. Yeah. Looking down the drainage where, where two ridges kind of came together like this. He can see that, you know, those ridges and everything underneath, it's all, it's all river bottom down there. And he's got the wind coming over his back yep. and, and he's actually got the wind kind of at an angle where if you come up on the ridge behind him at any point, he's got you on that wind. And then um, if you try to come around on any of the ridges coming up, he's got you there too. Yep. And uh, you know, so he has those, those kind of barriers around him too. And I, I've seen a couple other, uh, I've been recently getting into cattail swamps, uh, yeah. just, just scouting, not hunting. No. And a lot of like where, yeah, what I, what you just said, a creek or a river um, behind them, them watching over on the other side of that. I've seen that numerous times. No. I've, I've seen um, where like, like barriers that you can't get past Correct. No. behind them. And they're, they're, they're looking at kind of the open, everything coming in. No. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been pretty cool watching that. Yeah. There's just a lot of, a lot of neat things you find, you know, following those rub lines back and it all, it all starts off those rub lines, you know, following them right back. Um, they just take you right, you know, they take you right to where you need to go most of the time. And I, I don't know if maybe a lot of guys do that or not. I'm not sure if they do. Um, a lot of the postseason scouting, I, I can follow, I can see people's tracks. A lot of people are looking for sheds out there right now. Mm -hmm. They're looking for sheds. And I can tell they're looking for sheds because their, their boot tracks are not looking at any of the sign. And, you know, they're just looking for that, you know, that bone on the ground. <laughs> do you shed hunt? I do. Um, not that much. I, you know, I find a lot of sheds, but it's because I'm, you know, scouting. And I would, you know, 
I don't know what I'm going to do with them all. You know what I mean? I, it, what do you do with all the sheds you find? You know, I mean, it's nice to find them, but I, you know, hang them in the garage, I guess. But um, I'd rather do the scouting aspect. Um, but I, I'll pick up a shed if I find it. It's not prime. It's not my primary purpose, unless I'm after specific gear and I want to see if you made it. I'm going to try finding that buck shed. You know, I did find one. I did find half the side of that one buck that I'm after. Not this year, but you know, two years back, and that was pretty impressive. So, so uh, two questions. First one: When is when is postseason scouting? Like when when do you start that? I start it um, pretty much soon as I'm done hunting here, and I, I, I'm I'm postseason scouting now. I'm even while I'm hunting, I may not hunt that day. I might think my better use of my time is going to be scouting for next year, which I've done that this year. It's, I could have went and sat somewhere. I don't have a, a buck per se that I'm, you know, keyed in on. So I forego that hunting. I'm going to go scouting and I'm, I'm kind of doing that. I don't know. I, I never stop, I guess it's, that's what, you know, you say postseason scouting, but it's, I guess it's the time of year, I guess more than it, it yeah. just never stops. It just, you know, I just on the ground? No. I mean, if there is, are you out oh, there? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I got snowshoes. I'm going. <laughs> I might not. I might, pri you know, if there's a lot of snow on the ground, I'm going to prioritize the area. Like, I may not want to go to a, a specific area because there's too much snow and I'm not going to see what I want to see. But I might hit up a spot that I don't plan on hunting just to see what's in there. Because mm -hmm. uh, there's always something to go walk. You know, there's always something to go scout. And that's the way I kind of look at it. I got a just a bunch of what if spots out there and you know, there's always something to go do, I guess, out in the woods. Even if I think I heard you say something about, you know, that you can hunt too much, you know, but I don't think, you know, you, you can hunt a spot too much, but I don't think you can ever hunt too much. You know, I mean, you can go try a different spot, right. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think like if you're not scouting and you're just hunting, yeah, that's hunting too much. Like if, yeah. you're, if you're not collecting data, if you're not, if you're just going out and thinking that sitting in the tree is the thing to do, correct. I think you're missing, you know? And I, I honestly, I think scouting is hunting. Yep. Yep. But for other guys, I think there's, there's a, a, a they, they break it, they break it up, you know? Um, yeah. I, I kind of, you know, I might, I'm going to throw, I might throw a sit just to, it's kind of a scouting sit. Yeah. I'll walk in there and just, you know, a spot that I may never hunt, but, it, you know, it kind of piqued my interest at one time. So I might just go sit it, you know, for an hour or two and see what's going on. But it's kind of a scouting trip, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's as far as snow on the ground, that that really doesn't bother me because I got snowshoes and um, it's, you know, I will I'll go for miles and that stuff. So, yeah. Not... So second last question here. So. Can you think of like a, a basic entry level for, for a guy who doesn't quite have, you know, hasn't got that wall hanger, whatever that is, 100, 110, 120, 130, hasn't gotten up on the wall yet, wants to do something different this year. He's heard you talk about rubs. What is, what is something that he can just take away and, and use to increase his odds a little bit with the rubs? And I mean, we've already said it, but. Yeah. I would say if I was a, a new guy coming in, um, and this is what I did when I first started, you know, you, you really want to understand a buck's home range. If you're going after a buck, you want to understand his home range. And that's the biggest thing. What, how big is that buck's home range? When was that rub made? Um, that'll tell you when to hunt that property. You, you know, just cause you see a big rub, you don't want to just go in there and start hunting that property. You know, you, you want to know when it was made. Cause that's going to be, you know, what time of year, um, just be curious, I guess, when you're out there, just, you know, I like to know how things work. I'm in the service industry. So I, I you know, I gotta, I fix a lot of things. I gotta figure out how they work. So I like taking things apart, you know, dissecting it, seeing how it works. That's kind of what you're doing with rubs. Um, you're kind of tracking that deer, you know, all the way through the woods. And when, when you get done with that, you have an overview of that property and, you know, you can put a game plan together, you know, if you're a young guy out there, just, just put a plan together, you know, um, 
go in there, start reading the sign, you know, understand that different rubs are made by different deer. You know, they're not just um, all one buck or, you know, you know, that's, that's the big thing. Um, understand that different deer are making that rub and be able to identify if you're after a specific buck, I guess. But I mean, if you're just coming into it, you may not worry about that as much. Um, but. Can you use rubs to just get in a generally good spot that multiple bucks might use? Yeah. Yeah. I think those, uh, I mean, you could take a lot of these, you know, rub lines right back to maybe a staging area. Mm -hmm. you know, if you find that, you know, if I was a young guy, I would be looking for that staging area and hunting that. Um, I was, uh, there's a spot over here and many years ago, probably 20 years ago, I went out, I walked into that staging area and there, there sat a guy from Michigan. <laughs> there was a Michigan, there was a guy from Michigan in the parking lot. And he was, and I walked all the way back there and swung around. And he was in a stand up down like, you son of a guy. <laughs> but no, if I was a, yeah, I would be using that. I would be using rubs to uh, figure out the lay of land. Maybe not so much to go after the bedding aspect of the deer, you know, um, you know, that, that might come later, mm -hmm. but it's going to show you the bedding complexes, but I think that staging area or uh, primary scrape area, you know, if I was a young guy, those are the couple things I would really, you know, key in on those things. Um, I think that would give you your highest probability. Staging area could be in the, you know, throughout the year, that primary scrape might heat up during the rut end of October, you know, last week in October, sit that. Um, but, you know, as you're starting out, you can build up your, you know, your level, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's, that's so good. Um, is there anything else you want to leave us with? Um, just when it comes to scouting, I guess, uh, just be adventurous. Um, I just like to go for these walks in the woods and you I mean, it keeps in shape. You know, just be adventurous out there. Um, just get, get inquisitive with these deer. Really try to figure them out. You know, don't let them, they're not, they're not a mythical beast. You know, they're not, a lot of people put them on, you know, like they're unkillable. They're mythic, you know, like they're some creature of the, you know, um, they just want to live. They're going to be in certain areas. Um, yeah, get adventurous. Let the sign take you where you want it, you know, or let the sign take you where it takes you. Don't have any preconceived notions on these spots um, based off of what other people are saying. Read the sign. It'll guide you right to where that deer is. You know, it, it might be right next to a parking lot like you hear people talking. It could be way in the back. It could be anywhere. But just even if you know the property, read that sign every year and let it take you where it wants to take you. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that so much. I mean, it kind of affirms my style a little bit. So that's why I'm thankful yeah. that you said it. But mm -hmm. like, I, you know, I found myself this year, you know, just doing that, just kind of not having a game plan, just popping in, going for a walk and letting the sign mm -hmm. kind of dictate where I'm going, you know? Yeah, you, know? Uh, you might you might have a, a few spots that you want to get to, but, you know, just let the sign take, you know, on that way to that spot, if you see something, Get inquisitive, you know. Why is there why is there rubbing that thick stuff to the left, you know? Then poke your head in there, see what's going on. And then maybe maybe it's that buck's better in there and he's monitoring something, you know. So you just just get inquisitive. Man, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really wish this was like I wish I had a really successful podcast that, you know, we had 300 episodes and a bunch of people tuned in because what you talked about today, just breaking down the the rubs and 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 all of that is was so good. And I hope. I hope somehow this information gets out so people can hear it because this is going to help. This is going to yeah. help. It's going to help me. Yeah, I, I just think it's overlooked. I hear people talk about rubs. I mean, I remember reading uh, Greg Miller's Rub Line Secrets back in the day, paperback. You know, back when we had it. And, um, I think that's going to really help. Uh, you know, open up some. I, I think rubs are under over. You know, underlooked. I guess you know, they're not. You know, everyone's talking about scrapes, mock scrapes, bedding, but that rub kind of puts everything together. It, it draws lines in between areas. It, it kind of ties everything together. So. Yeah. That right there, we're going to, we're going to highlight that, what you just said, that's going to be a clip for sure. Um, I love it. I'm going to, I'm going to definitely, you know, put it in my bag of tricks this year and focus more on them and, 
Um, again, I can't thank you enough. I'm going to have to have you back on again because there's a lot to talk about. I mean, you've done really well out of state. Yeah. Um, and, and you killed a monster. Was it last year? It looked like that thing was. No, uh, yeah, North like, Dakota. North Dakota. Yeah. Last year. Yeah, I got a nice. I've shot, uh, I think I got five or six velvets out there this so far. Nice. And a couple years ago, opening morning, knocked down a one, you know, mid 160s. Um, that's based off of historical data and just, you know, um, scouting. Mm -hmm. season, you know, because you're out there, you're just scouting constantly. You throw us, and I'm not a guy that likes to, you know, I, I think there's there's certain people that like to sit all day. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not that guy. I don't like to sit all day. I feel if I'm not seeing anything, there's something going on somewhere in the woods and I got to find it. So that's where I just start walking around and figuring things out at that point. And you, you have a plan to, did you say Nebraska this year? I think Indiana. I think Indiana. I, I hit Nebraska, but I think Indiana this year. That's uh, I that one property that I had sent you that I was looking at. I I I kind of I looked over that acreage, and I think you know 40, 35, 40 minutes later, I had about fifteen spots I was I was interested in. Um, and I want to get out there maybe end of January or February here. And if I do, I'll get, you know, I'll let you know in case you can make it or something. And maybe you can, because yeah. I don't think they get the snow that, mm -hmm. you know, so it should be pretty easy walking, I guess, you know, walking. And we, just by picking those spots, that'll give us a pretty, you know, yeah. just build on that. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I'll, I'll be down there next weekend and then maybe the weekend after that, if I don't get it done. Okay. Uh, it goes to the seventh and, um, I, I went and pulled some cameras here so I can bring them down with me next weekend to put some cameras oh, up. Yeah. Not, yeah. not hunting that piece, but the, a piece close by to it. Yeah. Um, probably about a half hour from there or so. But um, you know one that's hunted that piece before or no? No, I don't know anybody's hunted it. I've driven by it, but I haven't you gotcha. know, seen anybody. So, yeah. well, awesome. I'm going to have to get you back on, like I said. And then uh, for sure, I mean, to uh, a chance to, to scout with you, I would I would take you up on that and clear my schedule for that anytime. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, uh that'd be fun it would be it would be so thanks again and um yeah this will probably go out here this took what we're two days away from christmas yep so hopefully you know i was kind of shooting for january 15th being when i was gonna get these out but i think i'm gonna start putting them out next week i've got three uh three podcasts lined up for next week too so okay. you'll be Maybe. my first you'll be my first one man <laughs> yeah i appreciate it'll be it be awesome <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. So, hey, everybody, we'll see you uh, probably in about a week and a half or so with a new one. But uh, this one, you're going to have to play back a couple times and really break it down and listen to it. It's such good stuff here. And we'll see you again on the dojo very soon.